It's a rehearsal for the ultimate test of survival. Please, come and help me! Help! It's about pushing the limits of space exploration and discovering what it's going to take to put humans on Mars. If somebody gets killed, maimed... For six weeks, teams of scientists, engineers, and volunteers are living in a 27-foot-wide simulated spaceship. Okay, stand by for checklist. The transmission is now complete. They're here to endure conditions similar to those astronauts would face on a real voyage. I think we've uh, used about two-thirds of our oxygen. And to try out key scientific missions that could reveal whether life ever flourished on Mars. It all takes place high above the Arctic Circle on an uninhabited desert island. The unique geology here, plus the bitterly cold, dry and dusty climate, and constant sense of danger, make it the place on Earth most like Mars. The goals of this pioneering research? To advance our knowledge, spark our imagination, and bring us closer to someday exploring the inhospitable Red Planet. It's day one on simulated Mars. The first six-person crew wakes up in its small habitat, or HAB for short. This was the first night in the HAB. Uh, it's been quite an experience waking up and looking out through the window across the impact crater. The habitat is perched on the rim of one of the world's largest exposed meteor impact craters. Called the Houghton Crater, it's one of the key features that make Devon Island like Mars. And it serves as a spectacular backdrop for both the habitat and its crews. My name is Frank Schubert. I am a musician and I work with, among other people, the rock group Devo. I also own a design and construction company in Denver, Colorado. The crew's first mission is largely to finish setting up the hab. Who was in charge of bringing in the uh, spacesuit here? My name is Sam Burbank, and I'm a filmmaker from San Francisco. Frame for two. Sam and I are going to go out and do some repairs on the hab uh, in full suit regalia. I feel a little better. My name is Darlene Lim, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Toronto. I'm actually doing my PhD in paleolimnology. That's the history of lakes. I can hear you well, Frank, with the radio too. <laughs> oh, good. How about the fix station? Can you check Darlene that yeah. uh, Is fix station working? Attach any tools that mount on backpack belt, straps, etc. I'm uh, Pascal Lee. I'm a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute and NASA Ames Research Center in uh, California. Frank, testing one, two. Radio check. Just two months earlier, when it was still 40 below zero here and the thin Arctic snow hadn't yet melted, Crew members were scrambling to finish building the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station, as it is officially called. The structure is almost exactly the size of the spaceship NASA envisioned someday sending to Mars with humans. In fact, some of the people who helped build the habitat were NASA scientists. But this is not an official NASA project. This research station was built by the Mars Society, an international organization of people around the world committed to getting humans to Mars. It's a private organization. It has somewhere around 3,000 to 3,500 members. Members of all walks of life. Very few of them are scientists. This is actually the, the door for the escape hatch. Most of them are people that have a passion for exploration of space, and Mars is the next target, 
They want to be part of it. They want to contribute right from the beginning. Let's see how he does. Some would like to see Mars settled. Some would simply like to see Mars explored soon with humans. And I'm among the latter group. I don't know about settlement. But what drives me towards Mars right now is the prospect of being able to, to send humans there to explore this place. And what the Mars Society is trying to do here on Devon Island is to seize the opportunity to promote the idea that it's something that's eminently feasible, but more so eminently desirable. What is this alien world, millions of miles away from Earth, that so many people desire to visit? This is Mars as actually seen by a satellite orbiter. It looks inviting from a distance, but in fact, it's a freezing cold desert. Mars lacks the oxygen we need to breathe, and its thin carbon dioxide atmosphere is at such low pressure, if you were standing unprotected at the surface, your blood would boil away. The thin atmosphere also allows intense penetration of the sun's ultraviolet radiation. Levels can reach a thousand times of what we get on Earth. And Mars is home to some of the most violent dust storms in our solar system. They last from days to months, sometimes enveloping half the planet with corrosive soil that piles up in thick, potentially dangerous dunes. But Mars also has an inescapable allure. Ever since our first spacecraft traveled there in the 1960s, we've known that the planet was covered with canyons and valleys, evidence that water or ice once flowed all over the planet, much like on our own Earth. The most recent high-resolution photos reveal gullies that look as if they were created by water just yesterday. All these water-formed features suggest there could have been life on Mars in the past, and it might even still be there. Finding past or present life on Mars would tell us that life on Earth is not unique. So just for the sake of knowledge, there's a strong reason for sending humans to explore Mars. But there's another compelling argument for undertaking this challenge. It's necessary to embrace challenge. Civilizations are like people. They grow when they're challenged. They stagnate when they're not and they decay when they are, are, become societies that shun challenge. The question of exploring Mars is really about us. Right now, space agencies around the world are planning to send more than a dozen spacecraft to Mars over the next decade. These machines will expand our knowledge of the planet and identify places worth exploring in greater detail. And humans could soon follow, according to NASA Administrator Dan Golden. We just put out a request for information for a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It will find the landing spots, not just for the robots, but for the astronauts. And in no less than 10, and certainly no more than 20 years, we'll start writing history again. Let's burn it into our brains that in our lifetimes, we will extend the reach of this human species onto other planets. It's an exciting vision, putting humans on Mars. But there's one major roadblock standing in the way. NASA right now does not have either a presidential mandate or congressional approval to send humans to Mars. Before NASA gets a formal commitment, it must be able to say what it will actually take to put together a human mission to Mars. And there are some areas where there are still many unknowns. And so what we're doing here is not so much putting together a human mission to Mars as much as learning how to plan for one. Okay, step three, donning the backpack. Every phase of exploration begins with a ragtag phase. I mean, the exploration of the moon began with one of Von Braun and a few of his friends, helped on by some science fiction writers. The exploration of Antarctica began with a ragtag group of eccentric explorers. It takes a few enthusiasts to fire up everybody else to get things moving. Okay, you guys ready to go? Yep. As they venture out onto Mars for the first time, crew number one is hopeful their simulation will in fact help get things moving. Uh, the first phase is a very special phase. We're going to let them go out the door in about five seconds over. We are setting up the stage for simulations that will over time increase in, in fidelity. Okay, thank you, fixed one. We go to Mars 
for a variety of reasons, but once we get there, the primary thing that we will want to do is to explore.